and I think I've got my computer computer issues overcome. Uh, let's see. This last weekend, I had the computer I had um, or that I'm using had just eight gigabytes of RAM, and I'm doing a fair amount of video editing, and it would sort of choke on those things. And then, uh, oh, so I I put some new RAM chips in there, bumping it up to 16 gigabytes. And what else? Oh. Um, the hard drive that I have in it is a solid state drive that I'd cloned a an earlier smaller standard drive and when I cloned it it ended up with some weird partitions and so I repaired those and moved them around and I didn't did everything this weekend that I didn't know what led to the problem plus I think when I was had it uh, opened up and was putting the um, the new memory chips in there. There was a wire that uh, came off the power supply and I thought I'd had them all bundled up together but it was ended up kind of flopping around loose in there and when I'd bump it with my feet that wire would uh, contact the motherboard plane and I noticed one time that I just had it open and I was looking at stuff and it when it contacted it, the computer shut down there. So that could have been what the problem was too. So I really don't know what the problem was because I fixed three things at once. But as long as it's working, I'll live with that. So today, um, what I'd like to do is proceed with solving some constant acceleration problems, getting some more introduction to that. Uh, we'll do more of that tomorrow and then uh, Monday we'll look at uh, applying those to the situation of free fall, which is where you just drop something in a gravitational field and let it accelerate downward. And uh, then next week we'll also do, um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, projectile motion late in the week. So anyone have any questions? Um, let's see, you've had one homework assignment. I'll be posting another one here uh, later today when we've got a little bit more experience dealing with these equations. So let's move over to another screen. And I'm going to probably keep checking my screen every once in a while uh, because um, <laughs> in my other class it would crash and I would not be aware of that. So I want to make sure I fix that. Oh, that wasn't the thing I wanted to move over there. Ah. Jack. I didn't even want that open. Okay, here we go. Wake up, share screen. Hmm. Well, it would share the screen if the uh, user was competent. Okay, are you seeing the thing with the paper showing on it? I hope. A bullet in a gun is accelerated. Um, we need to get away from using bullets in gun example problems, but uh, this is just one that I happen to have saved. Anyway, a bullet in a gun is accelerated from the firing chamber to the end of the barrel at an average rate of 6.20 times 10 to the fifth meters per second squared. So this is scientific notation. Hopefully you're a little bit familiar with it. And I showed a little bit last week on putting it into a scientific calculator. And I'll be using that here. So we have uh, acceleration is defined to be delta V over delta T. And that's the definition of acceleration. And average acceleration is just going to be 
Um, I could write it lots of different ways. The formula that's on the sheet has it V2x minus V1x over T2 minus T1. I could also just call it um, V final minus V initial over T final minus T initial. And so we can do things with that. In this case, we happen to know how long it's accelerated for. That's the 8.10 times 10 to the minus fourth seconds. And in this situation, you can make the assumption that the initial velocity is zero. So it doesn't say accelerated from rest, but uh, before you pull the trigger, the bullet's just sitting there in the gun, so it doesn't have any velocity. So that will be the case in here. And we happen to know what this average acceleration is. Um, we either put bars over the top for the average acceleration or that little subscript of AVG. So we know that. In this case, it's equal to 6.20 times 10 to the fifth meters per second squared. And that's the way that we express the units in uh, the United States. And we know what T final minus T initial is. It's that. So the V final minus V initial, if I just multiply out from underneath by this, I'll get my 6.20 times 10 to the fifth meters per second squared times the t final minus t initial, and I'll leave it in variable form for one step, and then I'll plug in numbers. And v initial is zero. When that's the case, I just draw a little diagonal arrow through this and put a zero on it. So v final will equal that number, 6.20 times 10 to the fifth meters per second squared times 8.10 times 10 to the minus fourth seconds. Hmm, this isn't gonna be going very fast, I don't think, but uh, that's okay. Anyway, now I have to multiply those together and I'll show you, you've probably seen me do this last week on my calculator, but when I put a number in scientific notation, first I'll clear this so it's not showing too much junk, and I'll put it in the center so the reflections aren't too bad. Um, slide this up. I'm kind of monitoring my screen here today. So 6.20. Here's how I do it. I put in the 6.20 and then on my calculator I just push this EE button. On your TI-83 or 84 or TI-30 you have to go second EE to get that to happen, but on this calculator it's on the thing. And as soon as I push that button I've told my calculator you're in scientific notation mode the next number coming is the exponent on the 10. And think of it that way. All you have to put in is the exponent on the 10, nothing else. And the number's in there, although the calculator doesn't know yet that I'm done putting it in. However, as soon as I hit the multiplication symbol, it knows this entire number, all of that stuff is stored in a single memory location now. And then I multiply that by 8.10, hit EE again. And for this new number, now the calculator knows that I'm gonna be taking 8.10 and multiplying it by a power of 10, and the next number coming is the exponent on the 10. To put in a negative exponent, down here next to the enter key to the left of it is a little minus sign in parentheses, and that's the one that I use in this case. It's not the, ab the operation of subtraction, although that key does work on some calculators, and I can't remember which ones it does, but 
try to get in the habit of using this one. So a minus four, and that number's entered. I'm done putting it in, but the calculator doesn't know that until I hit the enter key. And when I do that, it'll take this entire number and that entire number and multi multiply them together. And I get, oh, I guess it's a reasonably large um, V final. It is about 502 meters per second. So that's what the muzzle velocity is. And so we did a lot of stuff here. Um, I used one of our formulas. Anytime you solve a problem where you want to get credit for it and get in the habit of doing this on every homework problem too, write it down in variable form first. And that means with nothing but letters. Then start substituting values you know for those letters. And that's what I did here. So, um, and keep units everywhere. I didn't uh, show it on here, but if you multiply a meters per second times a, a second, remember when you've got a string of things multiplied together, 6.20 times 10 to the fifth, times meters per second squared, um, and then 8.10 times 10 to the minus fourth times seconds. That's like four things strung along, A, B, C, D. You can multiply in any order. So you can take the A and the C, which are just the number parts, and you can take the B and the D, which are just the unit parts, and group them together like that. So you calculate the numbers, figure out the units. The units on this one were meters per second squared times seconds. And you can think of this as a second over a one if you want. Multiply the top together, multiply the bottoms together, you'll end up with meters, seconds on top, seconds squared on the bottom, but this second will divide with one of the seconds and just leave you a second on the bottom. And that's why I ended up with meters per second. So you may think I'm harping about this, but there are many mistakes that occur when people lose track of units. So let's make sure we do it right every time. Okay. Um, while entering a freeway, a car accelerates from rest. Hey, this tells me V naught is equal to zero. Okay, and that'll be the velocity at time zero, which I'm gonna start that as soon as it starts accelerating. And we know the rate of acceleration and it does it for 12 seconds. And the first thing is draw a sketch of the position versus time graph for this equation. Oh, and then there's a part C and D to this, which we'll get to. Well, sketch just means a sketch. Here's what it looks like. We actually did something like this last week, only we were dealing with ex observational data for some object that was speeding up or something. But position means X, time is T, and the thing before versus goes on the vertical axis. It's like as a function of. You can think versus as meaning as a function of if you want to, or as a function of if it's meaning versus. Anyway, the thing before versus goes on the vertical axis. Thing after it, after versus goes on the horizontal. So this could be meters. This could be seconds. Uh, remember the slope of an x versus t graph is the velocity at some instant. Okay. Well, it starts off down here and it's from rest. And so it has no velocity at the start. So it starts off flat, but it's accelerating and it's going to get steeper and steeper, which is what this shape of a curve does. Okay. That's a sketch. That's what it'll look like. It's a parabola when something has constant acceleration, the position versus time graph will be a parabola. So that's what we have. Okay, and that's a sketch. I don't have any numbers on this axis or that axis. All I have is just the shape of a curve. List the knowns in the problem. Okay, 
Well, here's something we know. We know the acceleration. So A is equal to 2.40 meters per second squared. Uh, let's see, we know it accelerates from rest. We know that V naught is equal to zero. And we know that the time that it accelerates for delta T is 12.0 seconds. And those are my knowns. Now for this, I'm actually going to use my constant acceleration equations, which are on the formulas for physics 114 sheet. And um, to know which ones I'm gonna use, I need to read the rest of the problem. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's see, the next part says, how far does the car travel in those 12.0 seconds? Okay, well, what I don't know is how far it goes. Discuss how I could choose the appropriate equation to solve for this. All right, and after that, show your steps in following it. Now, how far? That's x. And so I'll probably be sorry I draw all these circles on this because I'll have to do it again. But here is my x equation when I have constant acceleration x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half at squared. Okay. Now that sounds like gobbledygook, but watch carefully as I use this equation and I'll use it in solving several problems. And then you should try to duplicate those on your own or look at the ones in the book and duplicate their solutions. Work along with the solution and gain an understanding of this equation. So uh, the unknown, how far, what I want to know, um, what is x? Okay, that's what I'd like to know. The appropriate equation in this, equa in this situation, I'll show you why it's appropriate. Um, x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. Now you could think um, what is x? Actually it might be what is the displacement? What is x minus x naught? But here's something that we can do on a lot of problems. Since we already said v naught is zero, let's just define the point that it starts moving from as the origin of x, where x is zero. So let's let v naught be zero and let's let x naught be zero. Then the x value will be how far the car has traveled. And what we now have in this equation is it's going to change to this. x is going to equal one half a t squared. And that's it. We know what the acceleration happens to be we know what the t is going to be, and so we know everything we need to do. I wrote this as delta t, but we can just call this t if we want. If we start the stopwatch, when the car first starts to accelerate, when it's at this position where x naught is zero, then delta t is t, So, because t minus zero is just t. Okay, well, let's see if this makes sense. Um, X is then going to equal one half times the acceleration they gave me, 2.40 meters per second squared. Whoops, meters per second squared, times T, which is 12.0 seconds quantity squared. Now you have to be careful. If you square a time, you're going to square the number and the units. And so I'll show you what's going to happen here. I've got a one half and a 2.40 and a meters per second squared and a 12 squared and some seconds squared all multiplied together. 
By the way, if you have two things in parentheses multiplied together and you square them, they both get squared. So that's something in algebra that you probably thought, what's the use of this? Well, here's the use of that. So just stringing the numbers together, which is what you'll do on your calculator. You'll have one half times 2.40 times 12.0 squared. And then I'll have meters per second squared times, when I square that, I get seconds squared. And look what happens to the units. Those divide out and I get meters. Take the trouble of convincing yourself that the units work out right every time because sometimes you'll catch a mistake in writing the formula down wrong if you're carefully looking at the units. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen on student papers where they know they're going to end up with an X, but they don't copy the formula down right. And then they don't bother to check the units that they're getting and they'll just say that they've got meters at the end when what they'd actually have are seconds or seconds squared or meters squared or cubed or something like that. And uh, that's not the way it should be. So we know we're going to end up with meters now at the end. So x is, uh, let's see. Oh, where am I? Um, oh, punching in numbers into my calculator. OK, I'm just going to do 0.5. That's what I put for 1 half times 2.40 times. And then I just take the 12, punch it in and square it. And my calculator knows to do all that stuff. And I get 173 when I round it meters. So there we go. All right, the last question on here asks, what is the car's final velocity? Solve for this unknown in the same manner as in part C, showing all the steps explicitly. Well, here's the thing. There's an equation for velocity as a function of time on this formula sheet, which comes out of your textbook, by the way. I used all the same formats that they do. V equals V naught plus AT. Okay, that's our constant acceleration situation for velocity. V equals V naught plus AT. Well, V naught happens to be zero in this case. So that's what we have. A is our same old friend here. 2.40 meters per second squared and we want to know what it is at 12 seconds so t is equal to 12.0 seconds so that means with v not being zero v is just equal to a t and that'll be 2.40 meters per second squared times 12.0 seconds if I reorder the multiplication, I'll have 2.40 times 12.0. I'll have meters per second squared times seconds, and we already experienced that. Meters per second squared times seconds. This second will divide with one of those, so I'll just have meters per second at the end. And 12 times 2.40 is 24.0. Five. No, 24 plus 4.8, I think, but I'm going to check it. Yeah, 28.8 is what it turns into. So 28.8 meters per second. So the final velocity here, 28.8 meters per second. Okay, in solving this thing, I've modeled a bunch of different things. One is keeping track of units at every step so that I can check and make sure I end up with something reasonable. Yeah, we measure velocities in meter per second. So 
that's something reasonable. Um, I write down the equation in variable form, and then I define what terms I can, especially what things happen to be zero, because that simplifies the equation. And I keep track of significant figures too. Although I was just doing that unconsciously almost. I had three sig figs here, three sig figs here. And so I'll have three when I multiply them together and I kept three here. The one half is exact. Okay, that's not something that has any uncertainty. It's not, an, not a uh, measured quantity, but this would be something you'd have to measure. This would be something you'd have to measure. So that's how those work. Okay, hockey. Uh, in a slap shot, a hockey player accelerates the puck from a velocity of eight meters per second to 40 meters per second. Hey, this looks like the initial to me, and this looks like the final. Or I could call this just plain V, or no, call that one V naught, and this one just plain V. So either one of those would work. And in fact, if I do that last thing, call this one V naught and this one V, I can use one of my equations to figure something out here. Um, yeah, show you how I'll do that. Um, first, I'm going to use V equals V naught plus AT. And the reason I'm going to do that is because when I want to know the distance over which the, the puck accelerates, that's the x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared situation. And in order to use this equation to figure out this distance, I need to know the acceleration. Now, I know the initial velocity and I know the final velocity, which I can use in here, but I don't know the acceleration. I do know how long it takes to do that. So, okay, got a jet flying over. Anyway, solving this for the acceleration, first I'd subtract V naught from each side and I get V minus V naught equals a t and then one more step divide both sides by the time and this is just the acceleration the definition actually it's v minus v naught over t this is a change in velocity this is actually a change in time it's how long it takes to go from that velocity to that one so all right well let's see the acceleration then ends up equaling 40.0 meters per second. That's what I called V minus V naught, which is 8.00 meters per second. And then I'll divide by 3.33 times 10 to the minus two seconds. Now I wanna show you something about this. Um, this has three significant figures. This has three significant figures. But when you're doing addition or subtraction, the significant figures kind of work out in a different way. But I've got 40.00 minus 8.00. Okay, here's what's going to happen. Uh, when you write a number like 40.0, it's understood from the way that you write it that this has a little bit of uncertainty in it. Okay, That means the digit that would come after this is worse than uncertain. It's garbage. Okay, Sometimes you'll use the digit after this to warm up or warm up, to round up or round down, but that's all you'd ever use it for. I'm not going to use it in a calculation. So I'll just think of 
this column is being worthless. I've got garbage here, minus zero. It's still garbage, I'm not gonna use it. So it's as if this 8.0 had only two significant figures when I'm doing subtraction with it. Then it doesn't matter anyway. Um, zero minus zero is still zero, so I have that. 40 minus eight is 32. So on that numerator, I'll have 32.0 to three significant figures, and that's still meters per second there. So now I'll just do this. When you do this on your calculator, be careful if you're punching it all in as one thing. Wrap the top in parentheses, okay? If you've ever got anything in the denominator, you need to wrap it in parentheses if it's multiplication, subtraction, addition, or whatever. So for the top, left parenthesis, 40.0 minus 8.0 in parentheses, and then I'll divide by 3.33 um, e minus 2. And here's the nice thing. By using that scientific notation thing on my calculator, that entire 3.33 times 10 to the minus 2 is treated as a single number in memory, whereas if I had gone 3.33 times and then used my 10 to the something button and put in a minus 2 up there, it treats those as two separate numbers. And on my calculator, if I divide by the 3.33, it'd do that, but then it would multiply the result by 10 to the minus two of the whole calculation by 10 to the minus two. And so it would effectively take this from the bottom to the top and I'd get a wrong answer. And that's something that happens all the time. But using the scientific notation function on here doesn't do that. Okay, anyway, I get, uh, let's see, 961 meters per second squared. For the acceleration of that hockey puck. Okay, that's not too surprising. Uh, when a puck comes off of a slap shot, which is what this is referred to as, it's really going fast. And um, got to watch out for those things. Okay, but that wasn't the question. The question is, calculate the distance over which the puck accelerates. <clears throat> now, there are actually two ways I can do this, and I'll show you using this equation first. And I can let x not be zero, or I can subtract it from the left side and think x minus x naught is that's how far the puck's going to move while it's being accelerated. I could let this x not be zero and just let that be x, and that'll be the distance, but I can do it this way. And that will equal v naught t plus one half a t squared. Well, here's what I know. I know t. It's that 3.33 times 10 to the minus 2 seconds, so I can use it here and here. I know V naught, they told me that, it's eight meters per second, and I just figured out A. And so I know everything here that I need to know to figure that out. And so I'll just do this. Um, let's see, V naught, 8.00 meters per second. Multiply that by the 3.33 times 10 to the minus two seconds. And I'm gonna go down to the next line because I always run out of space. Um, one half times the acceleration I just figured out, 961 meters per second squared times T squared, which is that number, times 10 to the minus two seconds squared and just punch that into my calculator and I'll have it. So, and I'll show you something that happens on these things. Just going to plug in the numbers. Um, now, I know I'm going to have three significant figures when I'm done. So, 
I'm going to just punch in the numbers for an eight. My calculator doesn't care if I put in eight or if I put eight, put in 8.0 or 8.00 or 8.00000. It treats them all the same. It doesn't have a brain. All it does is repetitious calculation. So I'll just go eight times 3.33e minus 2 plus, okay, that one half I'll just put in as a 0.5. Always do that. It's shorter than wrapping parentheses around a one half. Um, 0.5 times 961 times 3.33 e, e minus 2. Now, here's the nice thing about the scientific notation function of the calculator. Because it locks the 3.33 and the 10 to the minus 2 in a single memory location, when I hit the x squared thing on here, it squares the last number that came in which is 3.33 times 10 to the minus 2. All of that is locked together in a single place in memory. Whereas if I had done, uh, put it into my calculator using this, 3.33, hit the times button, and then go um, 1 times 10 squared, and then hit the x squared button, it would only square this and not that. But using the scientific notation thing, it does fix that. So um, that's something to know about. And I get uh, 7.99 times 10 to the minus 1 meters, which makes sense. Um, this is. That would be 0.799 meters. Uh, the length of this ruler here between my thumbs right now is 0.30 meters. So if I doubled that, I'd get something twice this long, and then I'd need uh, about an extra amount of this much. And that makes sense. That's about the length of my arm, actually. And I could see the, the player's hockey stick first contacting the puck and then moving it over a distance about the me the length of my arm before the the puck is released from the stick and so that answer makes sense now let me show you the other way i could have done that and this is something oh one of these problems i had on here maybe i don't have it here today um yeah, I don't have it. But there's another formula that you can use. In this case, I knew the acceleration. Um, I knew the initial and the final velocities. And I can eliminate time from the, the problem. And let me show you just how you would arrive at this formula. I'm not going to go all the way through it, but uh, Here's the idea. We've got an equation that looks like this, that V is equal to V naught plus AT. And then we've got this other one, which is X is equal to X naught plus V naught T plus one half AT squared. Okay, in a more advanced physics class, we'd be doing stuff like this all the time, but in this class, we don't. Uh, we just kind of deal with the result of it. If I solve this equation for t, I will get v minus v naught equals a t. I'm not done yet. I need to divide by the acceleration here. So t is going to equal v minus v naught divided by a. Now, if I take this, which is equal to t, and plug it in where I've got a t in that equation, I won't go through all the algebra. If you like algebra and enjoy dealing with it, go ahead and do this. I would get x minus 
x naught, or x equals x naught, too many algebra steps here, plus v naught times v minus v naught over a plus one half times a times v minus v naught over a squared. See where I had t's in this equation, I replaced them with v minus v naught over a. Then uh, you could call, bring that x naught to this side, x minus x naught, and it'll equal this junk. Okay, if you do a bunch of algebra, scary looking algebra, and add these two together, they'll both be fractions with different things in the bottom, so you'll have to get a common denominator. But you end up with an equation that does not have time in it, but it'll have x, x naught, or maybe x minus x naught. It'll have v's and v naughts in it. And this is what the equation is. It's this one right here, which looks like v squared equals v naught squared plus two times a times x minus x naught. Okay, I can use that on my hockey puck problem. And here's how I do it. I know v, it's the final velocity. That's 40 meters per second. I know v naught, that's the eight meters per second. And I know the acceleration. And so the only thing I don't know in the problem, at least um, I know it now because I figured out how far it went, but I don't know if I pretend I don't know x minus x naught. Here's what I get. Uh, v squared minus v naught squared equals 2a times x minus x naught, or v squared minus v naught squared over 2a is equal to x minus x naught. So let's just plug in the numbers on this. V is 40 meters per second. 40.0 meters per second quantity squared minus V naught was 8.00 meters per second. Divided by two times that acceleration I got, 960 one meters per second squared. So let's plug in the numbers and see how it works. Okay, um, for this one, I'm going to have to wrap my numerator in parentheses, but I don't need to wrap these numbers in parentheses. I just do that because I think it looks nicer. But anyway, uh, left parenthesis, 40 x squared minus 8x squared, right parenthesis. So those things are wrapped in parentheses. The numerator is divided by, I also have to wrap the denominator in parentheses because I've got a multiplication going on down there. Your calculator does things in exactly the order you punch them in. And so if I did that numerator thing and divided by two and then hit times, it would calculate this numerator divided by two, but then it would multiply that result by 961 meters per second squared. So it effectively takes this from the bottom to the top. And I would end up off by a factor of 961 squared if I was to do that. But if I wrap the bottom in parentheses, and now just go two times 961, I get 0.799 meters again. So uh, x minus x naught is 0.79, whoops, 799 meters, which is what I got doing it the other way, or 7.99 times 10 to the minus one. So same thing. Oh, I leave my calculator in scientific notation mode all the time. And uh, it's just because, um, I'm pretty good at switching from scientific notation to standard notation, but it's a pain in the neck to have to keep 
popping back and forth between the two on the or changing the settings on the calculator because in engineering physics almost all I ever use is scientific notation same with astronomy too okay um, that may be about enough for today tomorrow I'd like to continue on with this kind of stuff, looking at some more situations. So uh, we'll be becoming more familiar with these constant acceleration equations. And before too long, we're gonna start dealing with free fall equations. And these are the equations where uh, you drop a rock or you throw something straight up or lots of situations like that. And uh, the thing with the free fall equations is that we always know the acceleration, at least if we're on Earth, it'll be 9.80 meters per second squared. That's called the acceleration due to gravity. Or in Moses Lake, it's closer to 9.81 meters per second squared. So those are what we'll be using. And uh, we might start getting our feet wet in those tomorrow. So. Any questions on what I did today? I know I talk fast and go fairly quick. Looks like my thing is still recording, so I hope we're good to go on that. And uh, Mr. Ham, do you know the do you know where the sig fig um, quiz is posted at? Oh, I need to put that up today. That was one of the things I ran into problems on is when I tried to do that. So I will post that. And that will effectively be this week's laboratory is to do that. And uh, I'm also going to oh, just put some um, unit conversion things up there for practice, but I'm not going to collect those. But I'll put the, the sig fig quiz up there. Yeah, I did get that straightened out. OK, any other questions? When I put the second and the other way to solve this hockey question, when I put that equation into my calculator, I'm not getting the same number. I'm getting a completely different number. Okay, did you- Can you show me how you typed it in again? <clears throat> oh, sure. Um, first thing was, let's see, clear here. Um, I put a left parentheses in so I could wrap that numerator in parentheses. And um, what I'm really doing on the calculator is just this. I've got 40 squared minus eight squared wrapped in parentheses. So um, 40 hit my X squared button minus eight hit my X squared button and in parentheses and then um, I know I've got three sig figs on both of these, but I'm ignoring that. Divided by, I wrap the bottom in parentheses. I have to have uh, two times 961 down there. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, I got it this time. Yeah. Parentheses help. Uh, and it's, I am good at doing that because I've made about every mistake there is to make on a calculator. So um, that's how you get good at doing something is by making every mistake at least once. And several of them I have to make more than once before I finally learn. If you're putting the sig fig test today, when would you want that due by? Oh, I'll give you a week on it. Okay. So, and it's a quiz. You get, um, I think I'm going to set it up so you get five tries at it to get a perfect score. So, okay. And um, you might try it just once and see how well you know the significant figures things. And if you make a bunch of mistakes on it, then you can start watching the videos I've got on that. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. All righty. Um, nice to have people visiting class and it's nice to have class i'm sorry i had problems the last couple of days but i'll see you tomorrow <laughs>